No. I think we've established that having no memory management system leaves us with a number of problems. So let's not imagine that that's a realistic choice. Let's try to figure out something that is realistic. What we're going to look for is an abstraction. Uh, and this abstraction, this, this layer of indirection is what's going to help us to identify how to make this work. Uh, and our concept for this is an address space. And an address space is, well, it's a set of addresses that a process can use. Each process has its own address space independent of that of any other process, except of course when we create shared memory. And here's kind of the analogy that I want us to use to think about it, which is it's like telephone numbers. So a typical telephone number in Canada or the United States of America takes the form of you know, number, 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 and then usually for formatting purposes is a dash, and then four more numbers. Now maybe you're thinking, wait a minute, that's too few numbers, but, but hold on with, uh, with this so far. In theory, any number in the range from you know, zero to nine for each digit um, is going to be a valid number. In practice, um, certain numbers are reserved, like you know, three zeros uh, as the prefix, that, that first part, um, or uh, five five five. You know, it's used for numbers you see in TV shows because uh, they're they're not real; <laughs> they don't actually work. If you try to dial them, it doesn't succeed. Um, but given the number of phones in the combined countries, um, you know, there's, that's even if we completely filled the address space, that would be uh, you know ten million numbers. Um, and we have a population that are combined of Canada and the USA that exceeds 350 million. That's probably not going to work. Okay, here's the solution. Um, and the solution is area codes, right? Um, in fact, probably you looked at this and you thought like, you know, what do you mean phone numbers are seven digits? You know, they're 10 digits and they always have been. Whether you think 10-digit digits um, has uh, ten digit dialing has always been the case is both a question of age and location. Um, that seven-digit dialing was quite common um, when, I was, uh, when I was young, um, and then 10-digit you know, dialing was introduced um, in the Toronto region uh, at some point. But in other areas of the country, you know, there's kind of been no need, and 10-digit dialing was adopted on a basis of like, yeah, you know, eventually... Uh, we'll do that when it becomes necessary. Uh, you may imagine if you live in Yukon, um, it's still not necessary uh, since all the Yukon is you know, covered by this one area code. Uh, nevertheless, 10-digit dialing is um, common basically everywhere now. Uh, when you look at the map, I think you can get a pretty good indication as to why. Okay, um, so if we, we look at a number, you know, it's 416-555-1234. It's identifiable by its area code um, by being located in you know, the Toronto region, um, or at least it's a cell phone that's registered with that number. Um, there is, of course, a distinct possibility these days that you could, you know, have a number from Ottawa uh, while you live in BC uh, or vice versa. Um, and presumably, if you look at the area code, you know, 212, um, you know, it's New York City. Um, and hypothetically, if there still exists a district in North America where 10 digit dialing is not mandatory, if you dial 5551234, it will basically implicitly add the area code at the front of that. Um, and so uh, it connects you to that number in your local area code. So you know, there can be 416-555-1234 and 212-555-1234. Uh, and if seven digit dialing were still allowed, it would just connect you to whichever one it assumes is the local one and you wouldn't have to worry about it. So what we're actually gonna see is um, letting each process have its own effectively area code. Right? Um, we're not altering any addresses in memory. Um, we're just gonna add a prefix automatically to every memory location. So a process can write to location 1024 and a different process, process two, can also write to a location 1024. And there are two distinct locations in physical memory, uh, maybe you know, 21024 and 91024, just making up a silly example. So we effectively prefix every memory access with an area code. All right, all right. That's actually really easy. Um, and so now an address that is generated by the CPU, like the 28 in a jump uh, to 28 instruction, that's the logical address. 
and we add the area code to the front to produce the physical address, the actual location memory, and that's the address that gets sent over the bus. To make that happen, we need some sort of register that you know, contains the area code and will you know, automatically add it so that everything works out the way that we expect. Um, and in practice, the area code is in a register called the relocation register. So when the CPU issues a logical address, it goes into the memory management unit. The memory management unit looks at the relocation register, adds that value to the memory address um, to produce the physical address, and the physical address goes out over the bus as seen in the diagram. Now listen, in the example that we're talking about here, you know, adding a two at the front or a nine or a 14 at the front or whatever is pretty clean. There's no reason why the relocation register has to be perfectly even. You know, the, the relocation register could contain uh, a value like 14,222. And if that's the case, then yeah, it's a little harder to you know, see the physical address, but the addition is the same, right? Uh, we just made it a little bit simpler. Um, by using uh, examples that look pretty. Okay, but given a relocation register, we've actually got some things going for us here. The process itself doesn't know the physical address. It only knows the logical address that it wants to issue, 346, um, and we get a runtime mapping of variables to their physical memory location. We also get some amount of protection between the processes um, because basically you can't dial outside your area code, right? Um, we get even more protection if we bring back the base and, uh, and limit registers so we compare the physical address to the base and the base plus limit um, to make sure that we are sort of staying in the right area. Um, but that would actually kind of work. Um, and another thing that we've got is relocation. And we can relocate a process in memory if we change the relocation register's value accordingly. So a process um, that is currently loaded into memory with a relocation register value 14,000, you just move all the memory to a new place, you change the value of the relocation register. Um, so in, in the example that's on here, um, we change it to the new starting location of 90,000. And after that, the old location of the process memory can be marked as available, and that's it. You know, another process can use it, and there we go. Okay, there is now, you know, some amount of overhead here, right? Um, every memory access now includes an addition, um, possibly two if uh, a limit register is used. Uh, to do comparisons. Comparisons are pretty quick for the CPU, but addition can be a little bit slower because of carry propagation time. Uh, if you didn't talk about this in, in hardware, um, that's, that's basically uh, about the idea of like, well, you might have to carry the one repeatedly, right? You know, if you have a value that's 99999 and you're adding one to it, okay, you know, this is zero, carry the one, add that, so again, carry the one, and so on and so on. That's actually somewhat annoying. If you're the sort of person who hasn't thought much about the hardware stuff and you've been wondering why you know, your educational program at the university has made you learn some details about hardware, this is an example of why. Um, you've noticed in the section that uh, we've asked hardware developers to bail us out of various problems by taking operations that would be slow and, and doing them as you know, a hardware operation, which is fast. Um, this is a mutually beneficial relationship. A friend of mine who's a hardware person you know, is constantly saying it's really nice that you know whenever we I don't know, manufacture a chip that has a defect in it or something, we can work around it in software you know, by doing uh, some extra addition or uh, multiplication or something like that. Um, so it is, it is beneficial. Um, but I think you may be getting a hint as to why we need to talk about the hardware stuff because, well, you know, if you don't understand the hardware, the software you write may be slow and you might not have an understanding of why. So anyway, digression aside, um, we do have you know, a penalty associated um, with uh, doing this uh, additional step, but it does allow us to do more stuff in parallel. So you know, sharing memory without being so worried about people uh, messing up the memory of others is good. So we're usually going to say it's worth it. We'll take it. Let's also talk about swapping. So to run, a process has to be in memory. Uh, and given enough processes, or at least sufficiently demanding processes, it won't be possible to keep them all in memory at the same time. And a process that is blocked is you know, taking up memory, but it might be logical to make some room for processes that are currently ready to run. And the 
the process, if you will, of moving a process from memory to disk or vice versa is called swapping. And um, this diagram shows a pretty good idea of, of what it's like. Um, you know, main memory, some of it is dedicated to the operating system, to the kernel, so that stuff is going to stay. But the operating system can and will choose to move other processes in and out of memory as it sees fit. And swapping out is what we call it when some data is moved to uh, the backing store, usually the hard disk drive, and swapping in is what happens when it comes from that location into memory. Um, and unfortunately, swapping a process to disk is quite painful. Uh, if the process is using one gigabyte of memory to swap another process to disk, we need to write one gigabyte of data to disk and to load it back. Again, we have to read that one gigabyte uh, again. Um, and if one gigabyte strikes you as being totally ridiculous in size, at least according to the Mac OS system utilities, um, with five PDF documents open when I wrote this, uh, where the, the combined size of the files is 80.6 megabytes, the preview application consumes two gigabytes of memory. Why? Good question. Um, that's not the point. Um, the point is that like that's a lot of data and we would only like to swap it if we absolutely have to. Now, um, most operating systems don't actually do that in practice because it's too slow, too much time would be wasted swapping processes to and from disk. Uh, a modified form of swapping is used, but we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on in memory because we're still building our way up to that. The other thing to note is that when we swap uh, a process back in from disk, we don't have to put it back in exactly the same location where it was before um, because, well, we can just use the relocation register, right? And this diagram shows a progression of swapping some stuff around in memory uh, where you know, process A is in memory, then we add B, then we add C. Process A is swapped to disk, process D comes in. Uh, and then to make room for process A to return, we're gonna swap B out. Uh, and in the final step, we have C, A, and D all in memory, such that uh, everything is happy, right? And to do this, again, we just you know, operate using things we've already discussed. We need to update the relocation register when we've changed the location of A, um, but otherwise we can make this happen. Okay, now, Here's the thing. Thus far, we've talked about process memory as if it is large, fixed size, and just you know, a big block, right? In this, in this previous diagram, you know, A gets a nice big rectangle of memory. That's probably not true, right? Um, from previous programming experience, when you use the new keyword or malloc or something like that, you get you know, more memory. You, know, you don't have a fixed size block that you play with and you, you know, deal with you know, this limitation. You can just request more memory. Now listen, you might not get it. You know, if you ask for a ridiculous amount of memory, the operating system might not be able to fulfill that request, but surely the idea of dynamic memory allocation must exist. And so that's what we're gonna talk about in our next topic. We're going to think about dynamic memory allocation as opposed to thinking of just big blocks.